some really complicated stuff. But this one is nice and simple, and a lot of it is uh, visual. So it's all about the skin. So just as a little review, you know, the skin is made up of really uh, two primary layers and then a layer underneath. So the epidermal layer is this outermost layer, and it forms sort of our protective, waterproof, flexible shell. So it's uh, mostly made up of keratin. Um, keratin is a protein that is uh, produced by epidermal cells called keratinocytes. So when you touch the surface of your skin, what you're touching is your keratin shell. You know, so the living cells are down here, and that keratin coat is, sits here on top. And then underneath that epidermal layer is a, a bigger, um, kind of stronger, it's sort of rubbery, uh, it's like a, a heavy rubbery plastic, almost like a neoprene, um, and that's the dermis. So it's in the dermis that we have the accessory structures of the skin. So like our sweat glands, um, uh, the hair follicles that produce hairs that um, stick out from above the uh, epidermis. And then underneath the dermal layer, is a, a very flexible, loose layer called the subcutaneous layer. Um, this is the site of a lot of adipose tissue. Um, it's uh, what we call an areolar tissue. In other words, it's very flexible, so it allows the dermis and epidermis to move separately from whatever's underneath it, which is typically muscle. So like when you flex your muscles, the reason that the skin doesn't move along with that is because this subcutaneous layer is so flexible. So, that those are just uh, the three layers. You know, why do we have skin? It's our first line of defense. So it keeps the outside world outside. And to some extent, it keeps the inside world inside. So it's our primary barrier. You know, it's our first line of defense against infection, um, invasion, uh, toxins that are found in the environment. It prevents fluid loss. <clears throat> now, it's not perfect. You know, we lose some water through the skin all the time. It's part of the uh, insensible losses in your ins and outs. And that's because that keratin coat, kind of like cotton fabric, it allows some moisture out while still remaining um, uh, uh, fairly uh, watertight. Um, and that helps with keeping us cool, that evaporation. The skin functions to control body temperature. It's our radiator. You know, just like a car has a radiator, the skin helps to radiate the body heat that we produce on the inside out to the world. So like when we get too hot, we send more blood to the skin. That helps to cool the blood so that the body stays cool. The skin is the largest sensory organ. Um, you know, it has uh, uh, touch, temperature, pain receptors throughout. Um, so it gives us information about the world around us. And then the skin is the site of the synthesis of vitamin D. It's one of the few um, <clears throat> things in the body that uh, UV radiation actually does a good thing, and that is UV um, stimulates the formation of vitamin D. Now, in this country, we get most of our vitamin D through supplementation because it's found in dairy products like butter, cheese, and milk. But <clears throat> in other countries where that isn't the case, they're sort of dependent upon the sun to create vitamin D. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the diagnosis of skin problems is very much a, a visual one. You know, so when you go to study um, skin disorders, you're going to find lots of pictures. I even added a few pictures uh, earlier today because it's the best way to sort of identify, you know, different kinds of skin disorders is to look at what the lesions actually look like. <clears throat> so in dermatology, you know, uh, uh, appointment visits can be very short. Because really, you know, the experienced dermatologist just has to take one look at it, ask a few questions, and they're going to know what it is. So not a particularly complex, you know, branch of medicine, <clears throat> but it's one where it takes a lot of experience to do it well, because you have to have seen lots of different skin disorders in order to make those connections. <clears throat> so you can get skin lesions from systemic problems, so like in advanced liver disease, um, we see uh, typical um, uh, discolorations in the skin. <clears throat> Systemic infections, um, there may be virus everywhere, but where you see its, its results is primarily in the skin. So this is like chicken pox, small pox, you know, th those are systemic viral infections, but they're usually diagnosed based on their skin lesions. <clears throat> Allergies uh, can trigger uh, skin lesions, particularly urticaria, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. 
So that can be any food or medication, anything that's um, gotten into the body somehow. And then localized factors. <clears throat> Many skin lesions um, appear uh, uh, because of some uh, local environment in that place. Now, it may trigger an underlying systemic disorder, but like eczema, for example, often appears in places of the skin where there's abrasion, you know, like around the waistband um, or where the, uh, the um, shirt sleeve rubs up against the arm. So uh, localized factors alone or in combination with a systemic tendency like we see in some of the autoimmune disorders. So when we talk about skin lesions, there are a number of important things we want to know about them because they help to steer our diagnosis. So location, obviously where, how long they've been present, um, how they've been changing. You know, there's a big difference between you know, a mole that hasn't changed in 10 years and a mole that is significantly different than it was last week. So we want to know about its, that lesion's history. And then its physical appearance. So color, that one's obvious. Is it, you know, is it pink? Is it yellow? Is it red? Elevation has to do with when you run your finger across that lesion, does it stick up above the rest of the skin? Does it fall down? You know, is it depressed underneath the skin? Or can you not feel it? In other words, is it flat with the rest of the skin? The texture of the lesion, you know, I'll show you some examples of the different kinds of texture. You know, is it rough? Is it, um, is it bubble-like? You know, is it like a, a blister or a vesicle? And then if there's anything coming out of that lesion, we want to know what that's like, too. You know, so an edudate might be pus, like you'd see in an inflamed hair follicle. Or it might be a clear, like, serous fluid, like you see in chicken pox um, or um, uh, shingles or the herpes viruses. And then any association of either pain or pruritus. Now, pruritus or pruritus, you can say it either way. Um, that just means, is it itchy? And what's interesting is, as common as this uh, symptom is, we don't really know what causes itchiness or pruritus. There's some theories about it, but it really remains to be seen. We know that histamine is involved, but that's pretty much all we know. Some new research is suggesting that acetylcholine may also be a major player in puritis or, or an area of skin that's um, itchy. So a couple of uh, uh, the common skin lesions, <clears throat> and you should know these because these words are chartable words. You know, these are the kinds of things you're going to write in a patient chart based on what your physical exam findings are. So like a macule is flat and has a well-defined border. So you can't feel a macule, but you can see it. Um, and some people, uh, uh, most, most birthmarks, the, the dark ones anyway, are macules. So it's a good example of that. You know, an area of skin that's significantly darker than the surrounding skin. So flat and well-defined. <clears throat> a nodule is firm, raised, and has a part of it that sort of lies deep to the surface. So if we look at the skin, this is the part we see, but when we palpate this, we can sort of feel that there's an underneath part, too. So that's a nodule, firm, raised, and deep. <clears throat> a papule is like a nodule without the deep component. So there is an elevation, and it's solid on the inside, um, but it doesn't have that underlying roundness to it. You know, so this is... Um, some common moles are like this. You know, if you, you can feel it as you rub across your skin, but if you sort of squeeze around it, it doesn't have an underneath part. It just sticks up from the surface. A pustule has um, pus inside, so it <clears throat> oftentimes it has a little head to it, a little opening to the external world. Sometimes that head will drain. You know, so this is um, uh, your classic uh, <clears throat> uh, acne lesion, for example. <clears throat> a vesicle has a very thin wall on the top. Um, so an example of a vesicle is like a blister from a first-degree burn, um, where the, um, the epi what's happening here usually is the epidermal layer has become separated from the underlying dermis. And we get this very thin wall, which is the keratin. And then underneath it is usually some clear fluid. So vesicles are the uh, common lesion in chicken pox. <clears throat> They're also the common lesion in um, uh, herpes simplex. <clears throat> a plaque 
which is what we see in psoriasis, which we'll talk about that later. It's slightly elevated, um, and it too uh, is a little bit like a, um, um, a papule, only a little larger. And then a plaque usually has kind of a rough or scaly surface to it. So I've got a good picture that I added of psoriasis that you'll see what a plaque looks like. <clears throat> An ulceration is kind of a deep depression. It doesn't have a top, you know, so when you look at the skin, you're actually looking down into the dermis. So this is the kind of thing you see in pressure ulcers. Um, you'll see these sometimes in the, the diabetic foot, like we talked about. <clears throat> sometimes after a vesicle has broken open, there'll be an ulceration underneath. And then a fissure is a crack. So we see this in things like scleroderma and eczema, where the skin actually cracks open and you can look down inside and see the dermis underneath. Fissures, vesicles, are, and ulcers are usually very painful. Um, because the, the dermal layer is very rich in nerve endings. The epidermal layer has very few nerve endings. So anything that involves this dermal layer, this deeper layer, is going to hurt a lot. You know, it's why a second degree burn is one of the most painful kinds of burns because it leaves all those nerves exposed in the dermis. All right. So this pruritus or itchiness, um, it's associated with lots of different things. It's unfortunately not a very specific symptom. A lot of lesions itch, and the same lesion can itch sometimes, but not all the time, depending on whether it's being irritated or not. So we see this associated with allergies, allergic responses like urticaria or hives, um, chemical irritation from insect bites, the reason mosquito bites itch is because the mosquito leaves a small amount of toxin behind, and the mosquito leaves some, um, some antigens behind that activate the immune system, cause swelling, and make it itch. Yeah? So if it's a mosquito left behind that causes the itch, then how come do like antihistamines even help if that's not what Yes, it? because antihistamines help because even though the mosquito toxin is there, it triggers a histamine response. So the toxin is still there, but we're blocking its effect. So it doesn't itch. Anyway, it still swells, but it doesn't itch. And there again, we don't know exactly what causes the itchiness of skin lesions. We know histamine is, effect, is involved because antihistamines are very good uh, itch blockers, um, both topically and even better is systemically. So the best antihistamines are the, um, uh, the Benadryl class, but the problem is they make people very, very sleepy. But the new classes of antihistamines also help a lot with itching. So like in a case of urticaria, you know, the new ones like Claritin, Allegra, that class of medicines can be very effective and they don't make the patient sleepy, which is always a good thing. Itching can cause problems of its own. You know, when we take our nails and rub it against the skin, we have a tendency to cause abrasion, right? You know, we've all picked it or itched a mosquito bite into bleeding, I'm sure. And that now provides a pathway for infection, for secondary infection of that mosquito bite. You know, so, you know, moms and dads are always telling their kids not to itch it or not to pick at it because that tendency is to break open the skin. Now, evolutionarily, it's probably a mixed bag, you know, that sometimes itching may actually help, you know, to get rid of that toxin or get rid of that foreign material, but it also can cause a pathway for secondary infection. So, is to itch or not to itch, it's probably better to not itch <laughs> because uh, infections can be harder to, to deal with than the underlying problem. When we go to diagnosis skin lesions, some common things we do, if we're concerned about a bacterial infection, we'll culture it, just like anything else. Anytime you're worried about a bacterial infection of anything, always a good idea to culture it. Pretty easy to do. And the information that you get back is very useful because it can guide your uh, therapy choices. A biopsy is what we do when we're concerned for uh, cancer in a lesion. So basically, we just take a little piece of it, we look at it under the microscope, um, and then we decide if the whole lesion needs to go or not. If there's a systemic component, you know, we'll do blood testing. You know, we can look for allergies, we can look for abnormal immune responses in some of the autoimmune diseases that we'll talk about. And then if we're pretty sure it's allergy, we can do uh, skin testing, where we actually 
put a small amount of different antigens on the skin, and then we look to see what the patient responds to. Um, uh, allergy testing 20 years ago was a very painful affair. It involved multiple uh, small injections subcutaneously, which, you know, those hurt because it tears the skin. Modern testing, though, is much, much better. They basically have this kind of square that has row after row of needles on it, and they'll put it on the back, and they'll just kind of push it in real quick, and that's it. So allergy testing has changed a lot. It's a lot less painful than it used to be. All right. So we use some of the same treatment measures, regardless of what the cause of the uh, skin lesion is. So for pruritus, you know, we use topical agents. We use antihistamines. In really bad scenarios, like uh, terrible urticaria in um, a youngster, we may actually give a short course of steroids. Steroids work really well, you know, for stopping the itching and stopping the hives, but steroids always have major side effects. So in the modern day, we try to stay away from their use whenever we can. Avoid allergens. You know, if your skin gets itchy when you're exposed to latex, well, the easiest way is to prevent that is to not expose yourself to latex or nickel or copper, which are all things that people sometimes have reactions to. If it's an infection, we may need uh, topical antibiotics. We may even need systemic antibiotics. Um, antibiotics given um, uh, by mouth do end up on the skin because, you know, we, we secrete onto our skin all the time. And that amoxicillin or, um, or cephalosporin will actually end up on top of the skin and treating the infection all over the body. So it can be very effective. If we do a biopsy and we're concerned that a lesion is becoming cancerous, well, then we can remove it. And there's lots of different ways to do that today. You know, surgery, lasers, burn it off with electrodesiccation, freeze it off with liquid nitrogen, lots of ways to destroy skin cells. So um, it all depends on, uh, you know, the lesion and its location and then how severe the risk is for cancer. All right. So this talk is sort of divided into two big groups. There's the inflammatory disorders. Most of these are autoimmune. In other words, the immune system is the reason for the disorder. And then in the second half, we're going to talk about infections, um, some of the common infections uh, for uh, the skin. So contact dermatitis. Dermatitis is inflammation of the skin. And we call it contact because this is inflammation that requires uh, direct contact with the inciting factor. Now, this can be just about anything. You know, people are very diverse. Their genes are very diverse. So their response to the things in our environment and in our American way of life are also diverse. So some people will have dermatitis from metals. Nickel is the most common one. Now, it used to be that silver, you know, a, a jewelry piece or a belt buckle or whatever that was silver was probably nickel coated. Why? Because nickel is one of the cheapest silver metals. Now, in the modern day, we don't see as much nickel being used in American-made products because nickel allergy is so common. But in products made overseas, you still will get nickels or nickel, particularly in snaps and buttons. So the classic one is um, the, the snap of the jean at the top of the zipper is often, the back of it is often nickel-coated. So people with nickel allergy will end up with a red spot right where that snap sits up against their skin. Uh, cosmetics can do this. Soap, different soaps, chemicals, uh, I think industrial exposure, you know, people who are around uh, chemicals that we're not typically around in our household. Plants can do this. Poison ivy is a contact dermatitis. Um, and some people are particularly sensitive to other kinds of plants. So like evergreens, like we'll all have in our living rooms for Christmas, some people will have a contact dermatitis from the sap or from uh, needle pokes, you know, from the uh, needles from the, uh, the tree. You never have an exposure the first time that you're exposed to a thing. It's always the second time. So it's a classic allergy. You know, the first response, there's no antibodies, so there's no response. But the second response and every subsequent response can result in uh, contact dermatitis. <clears throat> Typically, it itches, it gets red, um, but there aren't really like specific lesions like we've talked about. You just get a red irritation, um, <clears throat> usually within a few hours of exposure. 
Now, this can actually occur within seconds. You know, some people are, uh, for example, quite allergic to cat scratches, and they'll get a cat scratch and it'll swell up, you know, within just a few minutes. That's a classic allergic response, a response to pre-made antibodies. Contact dermatitis does not um, involve, uh, well, okay, exposure to allergens, the allergens do require an immune response to, to be triggered. You have to be allergic to a thing, which is an autoimmune reaction. Some things, though, will directly irritate the skin. So, you know, certain, um, like, uh, uh, rubber cement or um, uh, materials that contain a small amount of acid, there's no inflammatory or there's no immune response there, but the irritation will occur from a direct effect, so direct damage to the epidermis. So here's a classic contact dermatitis from um, a, a bandage, from a Band-Aid. You know, you can sort of see the butterfly shape. This person probably had an IV right here. Um, so classic contact dermatitis. A lot of times you can make the diagnosis of what was the cause from the shape. So that's a classic one. All right. Urticaria or hives. This is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So... Um, it's the body's immune system responding inappropriately to an antigen. You know, a shellfish, a medication, certain fruits, vegetables, a bee sting, all of those things should not um, trigger a systemic immune response. But in a type 1 hypersensitivity, we're a hypersensitivity, we're too sensitive, we get a response like these antigens are some terrible disease. So, um, in addition to anaphylaxis, which we talked about in our immune system chapter, <clears throat> you can also get hives, which um, can either occur on the whole body or just in certain areas of the body. Um, these are red, raised lesions. A lot of times they have a sort of target appearance. You know, there's sort of a, a round circle with a smaller red circle inside. That's a classic urticaria or hives lesion. Whenever you see hives, you want to sort of look around for other signs of anaphylaxis to be sure that the, that the uh, patient isn't going to suddenly, you know, drop into cardiovascular collapse. So you're going to look for swelling around the mouth. You're going to check in the airway to make sure that there's not swelling of the of soft tissues at the back of the throat. If you see any of those things, well, that's a medical emergency. You know, so you're going to call 911. You're going to shoot them with an EpiPen if they have one. Um, and you're going to get them to the hospital um, so that their uh, hypersensitivity can be treated usually with steroids. All right. Probably the most common autoimmune uh, disorder of the skin is this one, atopic dermatitis. Atopic, we use this word to describe allergies. Eczema is an allergy-related condition. And a lot of times there's a, there's a triplet that goes with eczema. So when you see eczema, asthma or allergic rhinitis, in other words, seasonal allergies. When you see one, look for the other two, because a lot of times the three go together. You know, people with reactive airway disease who have runny nose seasonally from pollen in the air or changes in the, um, uh, the vegetation around us, um, oftentimes will have eczema too. So eczema is sort of the skin version of asthma. You know, it's a problem with inflammation that results from an inappropriate response to an antigen that's otherwise harmless. You know, pollen in the air in the spring is not going to cause you any harm, but in the patient who is overly sensitive to pollen, that same pollen that makes your nose run and gives you sinus congestion can also trigger auto-inflammatory changes in the skin. <clears throat> so in adults, we get a dry, very dry, scaly, very itchy, and it's usually kind of thickened. It's almost like alligator skin. You know, people start to develop scales almost. And in the adults, it's usually on the flexor surfaces. So the inside of the elbow, the back of the knee, um, <clears throat> places where flexion occurs, we often will see this. <clears throat> um, it's a chronic inflammatory disease. In other words, without careful treatment, the eczema goes on for months and months and months. In other words, it may never go away. <clears throat> now, there are some easy treatments for it, which we'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> when we look at blood tests, we see eosinophilia. Remember that eosinophils are associated with allergies. So this is a classic example of that. 
In the allergic person, we see an elevated eosinophil count. We also see higher than normal IgE levels. IgE is the allergy-associated immunoglobulin, or, or antibody, immunoglobulin. All right. One of the big problems with eczema is secondary infection. Eczema itches, and eczema causes the skin to be kind of thick and not very flexible. So you combine those two things, and particularly children, they break open their eczema lesions, and now you have a pathway for infection. Yeah. Is that IgE a separate draw, or does that come with something? It would come on your uh, antibody panel. Okay. Yeah. So they have to specifically order. It doesn't pop up. It always saves the bill. It usually saves the patient money if you order just what you want, though. Because, um, but yes, it would come on your antibody panel or on your allergy panel. Yeah. So treatment for eczema. Your book's a little out of date here. Um, there are lots of new treatments for eczema. Now, in my uh, clinical experience, the best treatment is the cheapest and simplest one. And that's to keep the regions, particularly in kids, eczema regions, if you keep them hydrated and you keep um, uh, uh, soaps and caustic materials away from them, a lot of times the eczema will get better with just that. Now, when I mean hydrate, I don't just mean like a little, you know, normal hand lotion on these areas. This is like cover it with Vaseline, cover it with Aquaphor, which is really just like whipped Vaseline. Keep it covered all the time. As soon as the kid gets out of the bath, you seal in that moisture on the eczema areas with a barrier lotion. So we're talking about, you know, thick, heavy, like Aquaphor Vaseline kind of things. Now, in the severe case, well, um, we used to use uh, topical glucocorticoids, which we still do. So this is your cortisone cream. Um, antihistamines help with the itching, but they don't help the eczema to go away. They just help with the itching symptom. And now today, there's a whole new class of topical medicines for eczema that are actually immune modulators. Um, so these are things that actually turn the immune system down in those areas. The problem is they're very, very expensive and they can cause some systemic immune suppression. So still, with eczema, you want to treat with the lowest level medication that you can or regimen that you can. And like I said, most of the time that works. The problem is getting people to do it. What they want is the cream they can put on the eczema and have it go away forever. Eczema isn't like that. It's going to keep coming back if you don't take care of your skin. So it's one of those lifestyle changes things. You know, you have to... Uh, get the patients to, um, you know, take care of their skin. So here we have two adult lesions, <clears throat> classic ones. So these are on the backs of the knees. You can see how it's kind of rough and thickened, kind of like scales. <clears throat> this is uh, inside of the elbow. Again, another common adult lesion. And this miserable little boy down here, had, you can't really see it in the picture, but he has it all over. Um, and eczema can really be fulminant in the very young. Uh, um, I've taken care of a number of kids who look just like this, eczema from head to toe. And the only way you can really treat it is with this careful hydration. You know, you put them in the bathtub and you let them soak up all this water. You take them out and then you seal all the water in with um, Vaseline or Aquaphor and it gets better. But him, I would probably put on a little steroids too for a little while to make it better. <clears throat> so that's eczema, very, very common. Um, psoriasis is another chronic inflammatory disorder, so it's an autoimmune disorder. <clears throat> Usually it sets in in the teenage years. Um, there's some speculation that there might be a hormone component uh, to psoriasis. It's sort of unusual because it involves T cell activation. So it involves um, the cell mediated branch of the immune system. And what it triggers is a proliferation of keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are epidermal cells. Right? So if you have a bunch of epidermal cells, what are you going to have? Well, you're going to have areas of skin that are kind of thick and hard, and they'll be raised. Because in these areas, the skin is producing more cells than in the other areas. So what you end up with is this um, uh, lesion that sort of looks like it's sitting on top of the skin. Now, it's not on top of it. Like, you can't peel it off because it's, it's part of the underlying um, epidermis. But we get plaques. So remember, a plaque is a, a, a hard, scaly, raised uh, region. Um, and psoriasis typically uh, face, scalp, elbows, and knees. 
There's a commercial running around on the, uh, on the TV these days about some new treatment for uh, psoriasis because um, one of the most challenging patients uh, to deal with with psoriasis is a young woman you know, who's very concerned about the appearance of her skin. And you can imagine that psoriasis would not only be a, a problematic disorder, but a psychological one too. So you know, efforts are being made to try to improve our treatment of psoriasis because it's not very pretty to look at. So the um, uh, treatments here, glucocorticoids again, common immune system uh, treatment. Tar preparations, you know, you'll find these in the, uh, uh, in the drugstore. You know, they're sort of brown. They typically smell kind of bad, but they're very effective against psoriasis. They help to uh, turn down this keratinocyte proliferation. So it's a natural uh, treatment, but it actually works very good. Um, the, uh, the brand T-Gel, um, it got started as a tar treatment, um, predominantly for psoriasis. So this is very red and very itchy, but I went and found this picture today because this one doesn't have the second classic component. And that is, you see this silvery stuff? Silvery plaques on an erythematous base, so on a you know, silver stuff on a red base, very scaly, that's the classic psoriasis lesion. So white silvery scales on a red base, yes? Isn't there something that diabetics get that's kind of silvery and iridescent to their skin? Maybe, but I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. One. This is not here too on the hairline, is it? Hmm. Is it along the hairline too, like big scales? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But this, the the white silvery scales, and you see how it looks cracked? It's because these scales get very dry, and then you can even get fissures in here too, where the skin actually cracks open, and it's all from keratinocyte proliferation. All right. So uh, pemphigus, fun word to say, um, this is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the skin in a very particular and particularly nasty spot. All right, so here's a block of skin, right? And along the top here, you know, here's the dermis, here's the epidermis. And these hills that sit here, we call these the dermal papillae. Well, pemphigus is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the uh, connection of epidermis to dermis. So it attacks this area right here, where the uh, epidermis and dermis connect. And what it results in is a separation of the epidermal layer from the dermal layer. So as these two layers get pulled apart, you know, essentially what you get then is, um, you know, here's the dermal layer, here's the epidermal layer, and you get this big blister in the middle. So pemphigus is an autoimmune blister-forming disorder. Now these, uh, and the blisters, a big blister is called a bulli, and that's what we get in, in pemphigus, is not little blisters like you see in um, chicken pox or herpes, but you get giant blisters that can take up, you know, square inches of skin. Um, now, uh, Anytime the dermis is separated from the epidermis, the dermis is going to die because the epidermis is dependent upon the dermis for its blood supply. So when these two things separate, eventually this dermal layer breaks open just like a bad burn, and underneath you get this um, ulcer of exposed dermis and all of its uh, nerves. So very painful. Pemphigus ulcers are very painful. In, as a response to certain medicines, you can get an extreme form of pemphigus called Steven Johnson syndrome. And this is where literally the epidermis like falls off of the dermal underneath. So you can end up with what is essentially a, a body-wide blister. Um, so Steven Johnson syndrome is thankfully a rare, but it's, uh, it's an adverse effect um, uh, resulting from certain medications. So in your list of medicines, in your book of medicines, you'll see Stephen Johnson syndrome listed as an adverse, a potential adverse event for a number of diverse different medications. So we treat this, again, autoimmune disorder. So we turn down the immune system with either glucocorticoids or immunosuppressants. I thought I had some pemphigus pictures. I guess they didn't make the cut. Is every blister pemphigus? No. Um, a pemphigus is the autoimmune version. 
So like the blisters you get from poor fitting shoes, not a pemphigus. Because a pemphigus is this uh, um, loss of cohesion between the epidermis and dermis because of an autoimmune uh, reaction. Yeah. All right. And another autoimmune disorder is scleroderma. And this is where um, abnormal amounts of collagen end up being laid down in the skin. Now, collagen, you know, we have two principal fibers that give our skin its character. Collagen makes it tough and, and rubbery, and elastin makes it stretchy. So when you have extra collagen but not extra elastin, the skin basically gets tighter and tighter. In other words, it goes from being like spandex to being like um, uh, the nylon that your backpack is made of. So it, it, it loses its stretchiness, and it actually starts to shrink in on itself because collagen fibers like to shrink. You know, they like to pull on each other. So we end up with a disorder like this, where this woman's face, because of collagen deposition, has literally been pulled tighter and tighter and tighter. You know, these patients kind of look like they've had the world's worst uh, facelift because the skin is literally all, it's smooth, no wrinkles, but it's also kind of puckered in and it doesn't flex. So like this woman at some point would have difficulty opening her mouth because the skin won't flex enough to actually um, uh, allow that to happen. So it's collagen deposition. <clears throat> Along with that, you get fibrosis. The capillary networks start to disappear because the collagen is sort of pushing them away. You know, collagen is not alive. It's just a protein, so it doesn't need a blood supply. So you get hard, shiny, tight, immovable areas of the skin. And in regions of the body that depend on motion, so like the joints, the mouth, the eyes, you can actually get functional impairment as the skin becomes so tight that you can't move your arm or you can't move your, you can't open your mouth. Now, scleroderma is actually a systemic autoimmune disease. Collagen is found in lots of places in the body, and everywhere it's found, extra collagen gets laid down. So we're not going to talk about all the details, but <clears throat> you can end up with renal failure, intestinal obstruction, <clears throat> and respiratory failure as all the tissues of your body become less and less flexible. So scleroderma is, is uh, a rare, or it's... In, the, in this class, in the skin disorders we're talking about tonight, this is one of the few that's a systemic disorder that is displayed on the skin, not just a primary skin disorder. All right, so scleroderma. Wait a minute, did I not pick the right thing? Hold on a minute. No, I did. There's stuff missing, like my clicker questions. Oh, I guess they're coming. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so from the autoimmune disorders into the infections. So probably this, the lowest level bacterial infection that involves the skin is what we call a cellulitis. Now, this has kind of an unfortunate name. You know, we have cells all over our body, but it's an old name. We call it a cellulitis, but it's really a low-level bacterial infection of the skin. Now, this isn't the kind of bacterial infection where you're going to end up with a cyst or a boil or an abscess. Instead, this is an infection of the epidermal and dermal layers that just causes inflammation. So you get redness, swelling, warmth, and pain, but you don't really get pus anywhere because instead of infecting um, a walled-off region of fluid, in a cellulitis, the skin itself is, is infected. In other words, bacteria has gotten down in there and has triggered an immune response. So it's, um, it can be secondary to an injury, but not always. You know, most of the time, though, a careful examination, and you'll find a small little skin defect. You know, somebody scratched themselves, they got poked with a pencil, something breached the barrier, it's uh, that epidermal barrier that usually keeps bacteria out. And then once the bacteria get in, cellulitis has a tendency to spread. So it'll start as a small red area, but then it'll start to spread up or down the, the appendage or the region of skin. So uh, one of the reasons that we, or, or you know you need to treat cellulitis when it is continuing to spread. You know, it's not going to get better 
and then you'll start antibiotics and you'll see it shrink back down. So um, the classic symptoms here are um, erythema, so redness and thickening of the skin, and pain, so you get red, swollen skin. Now, sometimes you can find, they call them toxic streaks, but you'll find these little red streaks that follow along the lymphatic vessels. And the reason for that is the um, bacteria produce toxins. Those toxins produce an, uh, an inflammatory response, and it's the um, lymphatic system is where everything ends up, basically. So um, you'll see these little streaks heading up towards whatever the regional lymph nodes are. So the usual bad guy here is Staph aureus. Now, Staph aureus is sort of a ubiquitous bacteria. Most of us carry some version or strain of Staph aureus on us all the time. Now, why does it cause infection sometimes? In some ways, it's opportunistic. It's always looking for a chance to infect us. Um, and when it gets that chance, sometimes it'll invade and cause a cellulitis. Um, so we usually treat Staph aureus with um, uh, first-generation penicillins or cephalosporins because it's a gram-positive. Now, you've heard Staph aureus associated with two other letters, and that's MR, right? MRSA is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Well, our not-so-careful use of antibiotics over the last 100 years has meant that there's a growing uh, population of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And because wherever humans are, Staph aureus is, Staph aureus is one of the species that's been really affected by um, antibiotic resistance. So today, in a cellulitis that isn't getting better, we'll do a culture to try to find out what the sensitivities of that staph aureus are so we can tailor treatment. Um, strep can do this as well, though. So think staph and strep with a cellulitis. A furuncle, also a fun word to say, good scribal word, um, is a boil or an abscess. <clears throat> Again, usually it's caused by Staph aureus, usually starts in the hair follicles. The reason for that is uh, hair follicles, you know, there's a hair in the middle, um, but then it's surrounded by this kind of thick, oily fluid that helps to keep the hair nice and moist, called sebum. So it's, uh, it's ripe for infection. You know, you get bacteria down into the hair follicle, and there's a space for it to grow and multiply. Um, so the face, the neck, and the back are the most common places for these um, infected hair follicles. Some people will call these an ingrown hair, like when they present, they'll say, I have an ingrown hair that's gotten infected, and that's usually a furuncle. <clears throat> you can spread these. You know, you, you squeeze the boil, because some of us just cannot resist that. You know, you want to get rid of that infection, squeeze out that, that pus. Well, you can end up spreading it to other areas of the skin that way. So if you're going to do that kind of thing, for Pete's sake, wash your hands afterwards so that you don't end up with these things other places. A carbuncle is a collection of furuncles, which sounds like a Dr. Seuss saying, but um, furuncles can kind of coalesce. You know, the infection can spread from one hair follicle to the next and can make this kind of nasty hair-based boil. All right, so you get this large infected mass. So here's a furuncle. Now, this one, you'd have to just treat with antibiotics because it doesn't look like it's ready to be drained. You know, it looks like it's just a bad cellulitis, but probably in here somewhere is a pus pocket, but it's nowhere near the, the surface of the skin. Um, so here we would treat with antibiotics. In uh, several days, though, particularly with a little warm compress on this, you'll help it to form a head, and then you can, uh, you can lance it and get rid of it faster. All right. Impetigo is a bacterial uh, skin infection of the surface of the skin. Yeah. With that last one, yeah. the auto one. Auto inoculation. Yeah. Yeah. So when that happens, like if they squeeze it, like and then it goes to a different area since it's an infection, are they going to go on like an antibiotic, or are you just going to wait for those to like? No. If they've got them all over, you'd, you'd start them on systemic antibiotics. And these, you can't really treat these with um, topical antibiotics, so you're talking about by mouth antibiotics anyway. So both of these would get that same treatment. But like if it's like... If you're, whether you've got a bunch of them or just right, one of like them. Just one of them, like, so no matter what, they're going to go on antibiotics. Yeah, okay. yeah. Unless it looks like it's about to pop open and be done. Yeah. All right. 
Impetigo, surface infection, again, our friend Staph aureus. In some ways, of all the bacteria that live with us all the time, Staph aureus is the one that is sometimes an enemy. You know, it, it doesn't play fair. It uh, escapes the immune system um, in a lot of people. So it's a very common cause of bacterial infection in human beings, regardless of the area. UTIs, um, IV and line infections, Staph aureus, major player in all those things. In neonates, because their immune system is pretty immature, um, impetigo is exceedingly contagious. So it's one of the reasons why we have uh, little babies stay home when they have um, any kind of a, a skin infection, because this can spread like wildfire through a daycare or even uh, through the, the kids in one household. Usually the lesions are on the face, but it can be anywhere. They're very itchy. The kids scratch them, that opens up more skin, which leads to more infection, because now you're, you know, you've breached that barrier. If you catch it early, you can use topical antibiotics. If it's um, uh, extensive, though, you're going to use systemic administration. And again, today we're culturing these a lot more often because of all the resistance of Staph aureus. So the this is the classic impetigo lesion. It looks like honey, it looks like dried honey stuck to the kid's face. And what you're seeing here is a yellow puritic, or I'm sorry, a yellow purulent exudate from the skin that's drying and getting sort of yellow honey colored. So when you hear honey colored uh, plaque on an erythematous face in a child, that's impetigo. So, you know, this is a, I would call this a, a medium case. I mean, this can extend all around the, the child's face. Um, and it does not mean that the kid has been neglected. You know, you see a kid like this come in, and you think, my gosh, how can you have let that happen? Well, this can appear overnight like this. So um, you don't make assumptions like that, because um, impetigo spreads rapidly in kids. So we're going to treat this. We would try maybe a couple of days of topical antibiotics before pulling the trigger on systemic ones. All right. Well, you've all heard of uh, flesh-eating bacteria, right? Well, it turns out that flesh-eating bacteria are not actually a new thing. It just got a fancy name because there was a particularly virulent strain that went around uh, the country. The original name for that is acute necrotizing fasciitis. Now, we know what necrotizing is, right? That's cells die. Acute means it happens all of a sudden. So what does this word mean? We call the subcutaneous tissue, in other words, the tissue underneath the dermis, we call that fascia. So this is a disorder where bacteria are causing necrosis of that boundary layer between the dermis and the, um, uh, and the subcutaneous tissue. So essentially, uh, <clears throat> particularly virulent strains, again, of... Um, uh, Staph aureus or Streptococcus, particularly Group A beta hemolytic Streptococcus, they produce toxins that actually break down the connective tissue that holds the dermis to the um, to the subcutaneous tissue. So you end up with massive skin destruction. You know these are patients who have very rapidly expanding areas of skin necrosis. So you can imagine that when you know, caregivers or the news look at these patients, it looks like bacteria are eating the skin. Now, is that what's really happening? No. The bacteria are disrupting the connection between the skin and the underlying tissue. That causes a breakdown in the blood supply, and that's what causes the skin to disappear. So it is not like little Pac-Man bacteria are eating the skin, but the skin is dying as this toxin-based bacterial infection um, spreads. Usually, again, like cellulitis, in some ways you could think of um, acute necrotizing fasciitis as the world's worst cellulitis. So it's usually there's a history of some minor trauma or infection of the skin that then all of a sudden takes off as this particularly virulent strain sort of takes over the um, infection. The longer you wait to treat, the more tissue loss there'll be. Um, and treatment for this has to be very aggressive. Um, you know, excision of all infected tissue, for example. So this is where it's almost like a controlled burn in a forest fire. You know, if this bacteria is going to continue to destroy tissue, you have to get around it. You know, so sometimes um, inflamed tissue is removed before it dies to try to stop the infection. 
Amputation is sometimes called for. And the reason for that is these bacteria are so virulent that many of our um, antibiotics just are, they can't work fast enough to save the patient or save the skin. So you want to start treatment right away. And in some ways, these patients behave just like massive burn patients. So you have to be worried about fever, tachycardia, hypotension as fluid is lost. Anytime you take the skin away and we sort of fall apart, you know, we lose a lot of fluid, we lose our electrolytes, it's hard for us to maintain our blood pressure. So we treat these patients very much like a severe burn and we, we treat them in the ICU and we, um, you know, we follow all of their cardiovascular health to try to present, prevent organ failure from hypotension. All right, we'll do a couple of questions and we'll go on. So answer the student number question, please, if you haven't already. All right, so jump in there. I have seven and you. Okay, there. Now we're getting confusing ones. Still waiting to tell you the weight to be respectful to. Did you answer the student number question already? Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. I got nine people. A couple more seconds, and we should be good. Oh, I counted over the one. <laughs> okay, that's everybody. Yeah. I'm getting there. You're not in. I, I, don't worry. I'm getting there. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, a 45 year old presents with a chronic blister forming disease of the skin and mucous membranes. Uh, the, the nurse would recognize this condition as which of those things? So the correct answer there is B, pemphigus. I so I keep beating you to it. Sorry, it. Carolyn. Okay. So uh, blister forming, that's the tip off, right? But it is important to note, and I forgot to mention it, um, pemphigus uh, preferentially in some ways affects the oral mucosa. So like if you look up pemphigus pictures on Google, you'll see a bunch of the nastiest mouth pictures you ever want to see. And that's because it affects the mucosa on the tongue and on the inside of the mouth. Um, and that's can be particularly uh, bad because it means that patients can't eat. You know, and patients who can't eat get malnourished and it becomes a vicious cycle. All right, a 10-year-old male is given penicillin for an infection. He has an allergic reaction during which he develops urticarial lesions. These lesions are mediated by the release of which of those things? Eight answers, but I have eight people in the room, so that must be it. That's B, histamine. So, um, you know, the reason we treat hives with antihistamines is because histamine is responsible for at least some of the characteristics of urticarial lesions. Remember, histamine is responsible for the redness, swelling, and warmth associated with inflammation. And what does an urticarial lesion look like? It's red, it's swollen, it's usually raised, um, and it's usually warm from the vasodilation that's part of it. All right. So some more infections. Now we're into the viruses. Um, the herpes simplex virus. The herpes family contains HSV1, HSV2, and the chickenpox uh, virus. Now all three of these viruses create the same lesion. And that's a thin-walled vesicle. So a vesicle, when you look at it, it almost looks like a tiny little blister. It has a red base, 
and it has a very thin, flexible wall, and then inside that is usually some serous fluid, so some kind of clear yellow, but not pus-looking fluid. It's almost like thick water-looking fluid. So the big differences between these is where the lesions are. So in HSV1, these called cause cold sores and fever blisters, so it's oral mucosa. HSV2, that's the genital version. It affects the, um, the reproductive tract. Um, <clears throat> the primary infection, so in other words, the first time you get it may be asymptomatic. Not everybody with HSV knows they have it, um, which can be a real problem, particularly for HSV2, because you know, of the sexual transmission. So um, this is a disorder that you're never really cured of. You know, the body cannot rid itself of herpes simplex because the virus hides in neurons. So the sensory neurons that provide to the skin, um, the HSV virus actually hides inside that neuron. And because neurons don't duplicate, you know, so they never die, they're as old as we are, that virus can stay hidden in there forever. So what we see is we see exacerbations and remissions. We see an outbreak of these vesicular lesions, and then it goes away, and then some years later you'll get another outbreak. So that recurrence is usually triggered by um, uh, stress. You know, a, a, a virus of another kind, sun exposure can do this, um, and stress of any kind. The immune system sort of has a little dip because you're stressed and your cortisol level is high, like we talked about a while ago in the stress response. That reduction in immune response, now the virus takes back hold again. So it comes out of the sensory ganglia where it's been hiding and it infects the skin again. So the, um, the lesions of herpes, chicken pox, HSV1 and 2, they're all infectious. They contain virus, and that virus can go on and infect other people. Now, in addition to the lesions being infectious, you can actually spread the infection even without lesions because the virus spreads through the nervous system. It spreads through the sensory neurons, gets onto the skin, and then can be passed on or onto the mucous membranes and can be passed, passed on that way. Some particularly nasty versions of uh, HSV infection the eye, you know, we talked a little bit about keratitis. <clears throat> this is where the sclera and the conjunctiva are affected by herpes simplex, and it's very destructive, HSV is. And then herpetic whitlow is where you have all of these lesions and breakdown of the skin on the fingers. So, um, again, this is usually from uh, HSV 1 or 2. We don't normally see it on the hands, but you can see HSV anywhere. Either uh, class can infect anywhere, just like chicken pox. Question. Yeah. When you say the primary infection is asymptomatic, does that mean you have to have like sex with that person twice before you'll be infected? Or does it mean you get infected? The no, it means time? you don't know when you've been first infected. So the, the, a person can be infectious, and they can transmit the virus to another person, and that person won't know because at the initial time of infection, there's no symptoms, or there's only mild symptoms. So it waits for an exasperation? Yes. The first time, a lot of times, patients realize they have it is when they have their first exacerbation. Okay. Yeah. So here's just that pathway. We already talked about that, about how it hides in the sensory ganglia. And then when there's a, a reduction in immune system strength, it comes back out and infects again. Very similar to how uh, shingles works. You know, shingles is chicken pox that is hidden in your sensory ganglia. And then when your immune system falls a little bit or your immunity wanes, it comes back, but it only affects one part, you know, one uh, uh, dermatome. Yeah? It, okay, the virus needs to go inside a cell for the cell to replicate it. Mm -hmm. So is it actually the nerve cells that these viruses... Yes, they, yes, the nerve cells get replicate. triggered, yeah. Nerve cells are pretty robust, so like... They stop replicating the virus, but in a recurrence, they've started up again. The, the virus has, has grabbed the machinery again. Because, because you said the nerves don't regenerate or don't grow. But they still metabolize. So okay, a, yes. a, a nerve can still make virus. Okay. It just doesn't die from it. Okay. Yeah, because it, doesn't, it, can't, it can't do that, so to speak. 
All right, so those are the vesicular lesions. Herpes simplex 1 and 2, chicken pox, smallpox falls in that category. We don't talk about it anymore because nobody gets it anymore. Um, and shingles falls in there too. The other big category of viral infections are the, uh, the wart-causing viruses. So there's a whole bunch of uh, viruses that are all in the same class, and they all do the same thing. And that's uh, they trigger an, an out-of-control growth of uh, keratinocytes. So basically, they form small little tumors. So what is a wart? It's a, it's a um, non-malignant, or it's a benign tumor um, that is triggered by human papillomaviruses. So the HPV is the human papillomaviruses. There's at least 11 types. Um, types 1 through 4 um, cause uh, skin, generalized skin warts. Um, types 6 through 11 cause genital warts and are thought of to be a uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease. Now, what your book doesn't go into because it's relatively new information is the HPV virus is a... Uh, uh, risk factor for the development of cervical cancer. So patients who have um, antibodies to HPV are at an increased risk for cervical cancer. So I say all that because there's a new vaccine that's given um, or that's recommended to be given to girls that uh, is a vaccine against the HPV virus that is associated with cervical cancer. So as an STD, this virus is not particularly bad. It doesn't cause symptoms in most people. It's hard to know that you've been exposed, but it sets you up or it increases your risk for cervical cancer later on. So it's really a, a vaccine to fight a virus that can trigger cancer. So it's a new kind of virus, and it's oftentimes it's a, a hotly contested virus. Some people think that it shouldn't be given, and some people think that it should and all that. But the CDC's recommendation is that all adolescent girls get um, the HPV vaccine. <clears throat> One of the most common kinds of warts, though, is called a plantar wart. You know, oftentimes we think of warts as having, you know, that you can feel them, you know, like they're, uh, they stick out from the skin like a, like a bad mold. In a plantar wart, the growth is all underneath the surface of the skin. So you have to make this diagnosis with your fingers and with your eyes not just by running your hands across it. So a plantar wart is a hard, firm, usually painful area that's found on the sole of the foot. So the plantar surface of the body is where we walk around on. And so here's our plantar wart right here. You can see that this area is kind of rough, and this area is kind of rough. If you feel this, number one, the patient would say, ouch, because they hurt. And then number two, you'll feel this kind of thick, dense thing underneath the surface. Now, plantar warts are the most common kind of wart. They're also the hardest to treat in some ways because all of the growth is underneath the skin. So you can't just get your liquid nitrogen bottle out and burn it off. Instead, you usually have to treat it with um, uh, chemicals for several weeks to make it go away. Um, so plantar warts are very common. HPV viruses are hugely contagious. So they spread very easily from person to person. Um, and they do so by shedding virus at the surface of the skin. So be careful when dealing with warts. Wash your hands a lot because they like to jump from person to person. Yeah? So if, you had, if somebody had a wart, are they going to have more than one of them? No, you can have just one or you can have a whole bunch of them. Yeah, there's a huge variation. And then but like a plantar wart, they usually occur in isolation. So you'll have a plantar wart on one foot. Usually it's the, the ball of your foot where you put your weight. And so, like, with the um, getting the vaccines that you're talking about, and you said there's girls. I mean, I know it's girls, but... Um, there was talk about making it for everybody because you could block the transmission, you know, if you vaccinated everybody, but the current recommendation is for girls only. So the, um, the virus itself, though, isn't going to cause, like, any sort of, like, there's no studies that show there's any form of cancer in males. No, no, and there's no symptoms. Of the, of the HPVs that cause cervical cancer... They don't create genital warts. It's just it's an asymptomatic infection that leads to cervical cancer. Is Gardasil the only vaccine? As far as I know. We just did a presentation. Thank you for reminding me the name. I dropped oh, it. Oh, that's fine. We were we just did nursing presentations, and this girl who works 
for one of the children's pediatric clinics or something, mm -hmm. because they are giving it to the boys now. And yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, there was some. There was hot talk about it. I think that we should give it to everybody. You know, if we're going to treat a disease with a vaccine, it means that we're treating it epidemiologically. In other words, we're treating a population. So if we're treating the population, we should treat both sides of that. We should treat the boys and the girls. It's only one shot. My kids teacher told us they give it to boys. Yeah. Um, what's it then? If a mom has it mm -hmm. and she like bad like whatever, does her child get it? She can. The the baby can, yes. It can be transmitted. But it's that only way. gonna really matter if they're a girl in the long run. Like right. a boy could be born with HPV. Yes. 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 How young? I thought boys got boys got we're all learning about HPV. Hmm? I'm not, why, why wanted to call it being a cancer as well? I haven't heard that one. Sorry. Um, That's what we taught people in our presentation. Before. Well, you, your information is probably more up to date than mine. Well, this whole HPV thing came out after yeah. I was in practice. It was the Gardasil handout that we gave people, which, yeah, I mean, I think it's true. I think what's on there is true, but they're also a business trying to sell a product. Yeah, a little so conflict of interest. All of it. Like, if yeah. one person in this whole wide world had anal cancer, we also right. tested positive for HPV, then that's where they're making their connection. Yeah, the yeah. So yeah. I don't know how. Because they want to sell it to the other half of the population. How young are they giving it? Like eight, I think. Like, I think it's 12 to 18. Oh, maybe I'll turn around getting to eight. Yeah. And it's not a one dose thing, it's a three shot series that you have to spread out because my daughter's in the middle of hers. Where? Do they get the shot? It's just a shot. Oh, it doesn't matter where you give the shot. Yeah, but she said it's so painful. They are fainting from it. Oh, it's that's just that teenage oh. girls, oh. remember? <laughs> you all were teenage <laughs> girls, right? Girl, it's really, really painful to I haven't heard that. You're telling me new that stuff. A lot of the boys faint. It's, it's like the flu shot. Boys. Adolescents. Boys, boys, boys are too tough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're getting to the end here. <laughs> Viral infections, the other big class is fungal infections. Now, the human being is pretty fungus resistant, but if there's one place in the body where we, we do get fungal infections, it's in the skin um, and in uh, women in the um, reproductive tract. But most of fungal infections are superficial. Um, Candida, we see affecting, uh, so this is thrush, so oral mucous membranes. It can affect any area of the skin, but we see candida associated with uncontrolled diabetics, and that's because candida likes sugar as a, as a substrate to grow in. So because their sugar is high, they're at increased risk for candida. But the tinea uh, group um, are the more common. So we name the tinea infections by where it occurs. So tinea capitis, capitis is scalp. This is commonly called ringworm. All of the tinnias are except these last two. Well, capitis and corporis are usually called ringworm. Um, it, it occurs on the scalp. Tinea corporis uh, occurs anywhere on the body, particularly where there's not hair. And these are target lesions. They usually are not target lesions, but they're circular. So please listen to this because I hate when people get this wrong. A ringworm infection is not a worm infection. <laughs> That's what people used to think, but it's not true. It's a spreading circular lesion, so it grows like this, right, over time. The ring gets larger, and it's a fungal infection. So ringworm, even though it has worm in it, it's not a worm infection. It's a, a, candidal, or a fungal infection. Tinea pettis is athlete's foot. Tinea ergugium, or ergugum, um, is an infection of the nails. Now here again, they developed a new treatment for this infection, so we've heard all about it on TV for a while, um, the, the various treatments for uh, nail infections. But basically they make the nails thick, discolored, and kind of gnarly shaped. You know, they don't grow right. These, uh, and um, they're easy to treat, but you have to stay on the uh, antifungal for a long, long time, which is true for all of the tinnias except maybe tinea pettis. Fungal infections don't die as fast as bacterial infections do. So it means that we have to treat these patients sometimes for weeks and weeks. Like the classic tinea capitis treatment is six weeks of griseofolvin, you know, by mouth. So you have to be committed to a long-term um, treatment. Which one? Tinea capitis, ringworm on the head. <clears throat> so here's the tinea pettis. You can see that it has this sort of circle, and that's because what's happening is the fungus 
is invading this way. So it'll continue to spread. Tinea pettis a lot of times can be dealt with topically, and that's because there's not, the skin of the foot is pretty thin, at least on the top. But the other two, tinea capitis and tinea um, uh, corporis, you usually have to treat with systemic antifungals. Yes? If people um, shower, um, will other people catch it? Yes, it spreads from person to person through uh, contact. So if you walk on the same uh, surface as somebody else, you'll get the infection. Good question. <laughs> All right. Is that any way better question than we are? <laughs> So here's a nasty one, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to uh, sort of skip a little ahead. This is scabies. Now, this is a really bad case of scabies, so don't expect to see little red welts all over a child or all over an adult. Usually, you just see them um, in uh, particularly the, uh, uh, under the armpits and in the groin is where you see these. Scabies is actually a, uh, an insect infection. So the cause is this little uh, creature here, which is not a very nice creature. It lays its eggs underneath the surface of the skin. The eggs hatch, the larvae eat the skin, uh, emerge as adults, and then start that process over again. So scabies is hugely infectious. And here again, you can't assume neglect. Just because you, a child has scabies doesn't mean that they're somehow being mistreated. Scabies is incredibly infectious. So you can get them from daycare centers, schools. You can even get them from uh, like dressing rooms in, uh, in uh, department stores and things like that. Not to try to scare you out of ever going to those places, but these little guys can live. They live among us, so to speak. Now, all of the insect infections are particularly difficult to treat because the, um, you have to sort of uh, use insecticide on the skin, and then there are a few oral medications which sort of target the larval and egg stage as well. Um, but we're not going to get into all that. So you see the, uh, the red marks. You also see burrow lines, which we don't really see here. But as the larvae burrow underneath the skin, they make a little line. And then, of course, there's lice, our other insect friend. <clears throat> um, depending on where the lice is, is that's uh, how are the louse? The louse is the singular for lice. We have corporis, capitis, and pubis, and we all know the pattern here. The eggs uh, get laid on the hair shaft. Um, they hatch. The lice eat the human uh, scalp and eat the uh, keratin uh, that's being um, turned over all the time. They suck blood for the production of the ova, and of course that creates a lot of itching. So here's our friend the head louse. And here are its eggs uh, stuck to the side of the hair. And all of you nursing students, I'm sure, will all learn how to check for head lice because it's one of those things that has to be done from time to time, even though it's creepy. So the uh, treatment for lice is you have to break the cycle. So you have to destroy the insects and you have to get rid of the eggs. So usually it involves insect, insecticide-laden shampoo and then a special comb to comb all those eggs out. Because until you get rid of the eggs and the adults, you're going to keep having infection. Again, this is highly contagious. So lice can jump from person to person. Um, shared uh, um, combs, hats, clothing, all of those things can spread. Pediculosis is the technical term for a louse infection. Man, I'm not getting through this very fast. All right, we're going to stop right there. We're not going to get into the skin tumors. The, the lesson here is the worst skin tumor is, anybody know? Melanoma. Very good. Malignant melanoma. And that's because usually by the time you find it, it's already metastasized. But we are sort of out of time, so we're not going to get into the skin cancers. Um, the, the key to the most dangerous thing for the risk of skin cancer is sun exposure at an early age. Now, sun exposure over your whole life still matters, but UV exposure early in life increases your risk faster than anything else does. So when you all have little babies, as some of you already do, keep them in sunscreen because they'll thank you later because their skin will be better.